Hello, everyone. Welcome to Night AI Institute. The AI fueled organization will look to highlight stories and perceptive perspectives on the concept of being AI fuel and what it get there in, in different industries. So the Deloitte AI Institute helps organizations globally transform with AI by connecting the different dimensions of the robust, dynamic, and rapidly evolving AI ecosystem. We connect across AI academic research, startups, mature AI products, AI visionaries, to real world use cases from risks, policies, and ethics to future of work and AI talent. Today, we are going to dive deep into the consumer industries, and I will turn it over to Nitin Mittal to get us started. Over to you, Nitin. Yeah, thank you, Mina, yeah. and uh, good to be back. This is uh, Nitin Mittal, US uh, Deloitte uh, leader for artificial intelligence. And I spend most of my time with clients and organizations in terms of helping them to become AI-fueled organizations which is the topic of discussion today. Anthony? Yeah, hey, thanks. Uh, really excited to be here with everybody today, especially people that I have such a tremendous amount of respect for. I have the privilege of being uh, Deloitte's US consulting leader for the consumer industry. Uh, we have the opportunity to serve the world's largest companies with the focus on enhancing their understanding and engagement with their own consumers and the continued shift to being both profitable and purposeful. Uh, you know, AI is undeniably making a transformative impact. We're seeing it more integrated into the fabric of the enterprise as brands look to maximize relevancy, build trust, build consumer and employee loyalty. And the implementation, implementation of technology is becoming so much easier that the differentiator is really this idea of the age of with on how do we take AI and combine it with human insights and human experience to reshape the future. So just thrilled about the opportunity today. Over to you, Nishida. Thanks, Anthony. Hi, everybody. I'm Nishida Henry. I serve as our Deloitte Consulting Chief Innovation Officer. And in that role, I get to figure out how we're going to enter new markets, create new solutions using next-gen technologies like AI. Some examples of that are things that Anthony actually mentioned when we talk about the age of width. How do we actually put machines with humans and create better outputs, whether that's in things like creating smart factories, using the edge, using AI, using cloud platforms in order to improve manufacturing output, or whether it's in life sciences and healthcare in order to actually improve health outcomes for us as patients. Or as we're gonna talk about today in consumer, how to improve our overall customer experience and connect the front and back office in a seamless manner. So I'm looking forward to the discussion today with our panelists here, and our conversation is really going to fuel around AI-fueled organizations. I use fuels twice for a reason. Um, it's all about the modern economy, and the modern economy is really focused on tech-centric organizations. How is next-generation technologies advancing organizations to better serve their constituents, and how is AI enabling them to do that? So let's get to the conversation. But first, if you have any questions, please do put them into the comment section. We will hopefully get to them throughout this conversation and wanna make sure we're having the conversation you wanna hear. All right, Nitin, let's go to you first. So AI-fueled organizations, we've been using that term in the market for some months now. I'd love to hear your perspective and help us remind the audience, what does that actually mean? And can you give us some examples of AI-fueled organizations? Yeah, no, absolutely. If we talk about an AI-fueled organization, and as I've kind of outlined in some of the previous uh, conversations, let me anchor on something that Anthony mentioned as part of his introduction, the age of width. What does the age of width mean? It essentially means that in the economy that we're living in today, we have now got the means for humans to interact with intelligent machines whether those intelligent machines are smart robots or whether that is smart gadgets, smart appliances, or many of the consumer uh, electronics that we actually tend to interact with or buy as uh, individuals. It also means software machines, software machines in the form of algorithms, AI systems, as well as smart capabilities that are being built in many of these systems that many organizations actually implement. 
But when we live in this age of width, the systems that we implement, the environment that we're interacting with, the devices, the gadgets, the appliances, the processes that we partake on a daily basis, they generate data. They generate data. Data cannot necessarily be viewed just as the digital exhaust of a system that is being implemented or an interaction that is being uh, taking place. Rather, organizations need to view data as a strategic asset, wherein it is the lifeblood of that enterprise. And when enterprises think of data as their lifeblood, they have the means and they have the wherewithal and they develop the DNA and the cultural habit to start generating insights from that data. Generating insights and weaving those insights into the very fabric of the day-to-day -day business decision-making architecture of that enterprise. Organizations like Amazon have done that for over a decade, but so have some of the traditional players like Ping Ang in China, or even some of the largest uh, uh, utility companies in the US or health insurance companies in the US are truly viewing data as a strategic asset, applying advanced algorithms and data science models to generate insights, not for the purposes of just reporting or visualization or predicting, but truly weaving it into the business decision-making fabric, like kind of what I was outlining. And when that becomes the cultural norm, when that becomes part of the DNA of that organization, and that becomes the very ethos of that enterprise, as opposed to just a set of algorithms or a technology that is implemented that truly enables that organization to start becoming on the path of being AI fueled. Awesome. Thank you, Nitin. Super helpful. And as I think you, your analogy is d data as DNA, I also think of it as saying, hey, data is oil that's necessary for an organization to run, but insights are the true power that the organizations can then generate for better outcomes. So Anthony, I'm going to ask you as the leader of our consumer industry, you um, know better than anyone how broad and diverse that industry is, right? We have retail, we have auto, we have tra uh, travel and hospitality, all of them with incredibly diverse needs and incredibly diverse implementations of AI field organizations. We'd love to hear some examples from you on what you're seeing our clients do in terms of becoming AI fueled. Yeah, no, look, Nishida, you nailed it. Uh, the consumer industry within Deloitte is very broad, include many of the sectors that you just described. And if you begin to unpack that even further, there's over 20 segments across all those sectors, all of which have very unique characteristics. So the level of difficulty to be able to talk about each of those segments would be high, but there is a common shift across all of those sectors. And it's largely driven by the availability the acceleration and the volume of data. And AI sits at the heart of capturing growth. And it shifted the enterprise from being product led to consumer led, which also shifts the capability to be more granular, more personal, more localized, more precise. And then, you know, Nitin, you talked a little bit about the value of data. And Nishida, you talked about data in the enterprise. You know, we think about it as the insights value chain. And it isn't about making better decisions. It's about empowering a different set of decisions. And when we start to embody this idea of empowerment, then the potential increases. And the conversations that many of our clients are having are not only for looking for ways to connect the enterprise, enterprise through the use of AI, but the new set of use cases that you can start to contemplate around sustainability, around building responsible platforms, around building equitable platforms. So the horizon fundamentally shifts. The more you connect the enterprise, the greater the opportunity. Awesome. Love that connectivity. And, you know, Anthony, I know you and I have also talked about that decision making and how can AI improve it with enabling faster, better micro decisions, right? Things that have to happen every day very, very quickly, whether it's pricing on the floor, right? Or whether it's actually, you know, personalizing the experience for an individual when they walk into a store or into a hotel. Um, you know, is there any, any examples of micro decision making um, that you might have? 
Well, I mean, I think there's there's you you raised a bunch of examples. It could be around warehouse automation. It could be virtual stores. It could be, you know, assortment on shelves. It could be real time, real time replenishment. The interesting thing, though, Nishita, is if I think about the last handful of conversations that we've had with senior executives trying to take AI to the next level, many of the capital investments that have been made over the last few years have largely been made. I'd say in very specific functional areas, whether they be back office or front office components. But what you're talking about is you you really want to get to a point where you're automating the entire value chain, then every member of the organization, every business unit within the organization must come to the table to deliver on matching kind of the supply and demand, which again is largely going to be consumer led. So this isn't just about adding AI and algorithms within the plant. It's about making sure the inventory matches. It's about getting the distribution right. And it's about, most importantly, the experience matching the consumer's expectation in this new consumer-led market. Love it. It's that front office and back office coming together and making sure they're working in harmony using that data. So thank you for those examples. Okay, I'm going to switch topics to ecosystems. And Anthony, I'll start with you on this and then and we'll move to Nitin. But you know, you talked about organizations creating these unique experiences, improving the back end in order to improve that front end experience. And I can only imagine to do that well, it takes a constituency of parties to come together to create that. And I know, you know, ecosystems is our buzzword of the decade, uh, but it is critically important to bringing the right skills at the right time for the right outcomes. Would love to hear your perspective on ecosystems and where you see them coming together for consumer. Yeah, I mean, so it's interesting, Nishida, you, you mentioned ecosystem is the buzzword. I mean, there are so many, you know, if I think about ecosystems, I'd share for contemplation from those participating today, you know, a definition that we have kind of used within, you know, Deloitte. It's an organizing construct for multiple or multi-party strategic relationships in which the value of the collective is greater than the value of one. And what this really leads to is uh, the relationships increase insights, it increases creativity, it increases learning. And so if you start to figure out like, all right, so that all sounds great, but like, how does AI really relate to that? Well, to be effective, back to being part of the consumer-led enterprise, to be effective, organizations need the best consumer insights. While organizations may have good first-party data, they need more robust third-party data, which means we're gonna tap into a broader set of ecosystems. And at the enterprise level, if you move beyond insights, ecosystems give businesses an opportunity to learn. And it's a broader engagement with partners that really could reshape the way you think about things. Look, we're seeing this come to life in the capital markets. So there's a great example out there without mentioning company names where the hedge funds joined analyst calls. And as the executive team within a company was fielding questions around store traffic, the hedge fund teams were studying satellite views of store traffic and had better insights than the executive team. If we think about kind of bringing those two things together, this idea that the best possible thinking, the best possible potential happens within our organization, again, limits that insight, limits the creativity. And the last thing it li limits is learning. And I'll share this one last thought. I'm reading a great book right now called Freedom from the Known. And the thing that stands out most for me is that knowledge is burdened with the past and learning is present forward. So I think ecosystems provides one of the best catalysts for that. I love it. Knowledge is burdened by the past and learning is about the future. It's great. That's great. Um, you know, I, in my role also, you know, deal with and pull together and I'm a curator of ecosystems, a participant of ecosystems. Um, and some of the things that we're seeing across the industry really reflect a lot of what you said. There is increasing demand from investors, from shareholders, from stakeholders, in order for organizations to be putting those ecosystems together. Because like you said, no matter how wonderful your organization is, there are more yeah. people outside than there are inside. <laughs> 100%. Right, and how do you tap into that and bring that together? Um, yeah. So Nitin, you know, let's go back to you around you know, AI fueled and ecosystems and how organizations are leveraging those to create smarter and make more responsible decisions. 
right, about the organizations. Can you unpack that a little more and tell us about how this use of smarter and more responsible decisions relates to ethical AI and how we view that? Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, in fact, let me do this. Uh, let me expand this beyond just uh, the topic of ethics. You know, Anthony kind of mentioned about organizations and enterprises looking for the best insight and in many cases, the best talent that they could find or the best decisions that they could actually reach. Let me sort of expand on that by saying best insights, best decisions that they could make in a trustworthy manner. Where it's not just about the best insights that are being brought to bear, it's also essentially insights that can be trusted. And I specifically want to kind of highlight trustworthiness because trustworthiness has many connotations to it. It has the connotations of being fair and impartial in terms of the actual uh, underlying algorithms that help render a particular decision or help generate an insight. It has the connotation of being transparent and the fact that the AI systems and the output and the predictions need to be explained and cannot and should not be treated as a black box. There's the element of responsibility, responsibility to customers, responsibility to stakeholders, responsibility to your employees, and responsibility to the society. It's not just about shareholder value that could be generated through the application of AI. It is also about the responsibility to society, the environment that we live in, the norms that we have to adhere to, and making sure that our brand is consistent with those uh, societal norms. It goes to the topic of robustness and reliability so that uh, this, through the study and comprehension of data, we can get to reliable outcomes, reliable predictions in a manner that can be trusted. And yes, it also involves privacy, privacy as it relates to data, privacy as it relates to an individual interaction with a company. All of them are part and parcel of this notion of uh, trustworthiness. And it is absolutely key in the field of AI, which at the end of the day, in a sense, is automating the human cognitive ability and applying it to generate insights, to render decisions, to undertake autonomous actions, that all of them are taken in a manner that your brand is trusted, the output of what is being generated is trusted, the application of AI is being trusted and that consumers and individuals feel that they can absolutely trust the output and the systems that are helping to generate the type of actions that are becoming more and more and more autonomous. Fantastic. I love the talking around trust, trustworthiness, and then purpose, right? Anthony mentioned purpose before, and you tied it together with kind of the, the new philosophy around ESG, right? Environmental, social, corporate governance, and how are we using and making sure that the systems we're building using AI will be in harmony with that. So it's great. And, and interesting, you know, we have a question from the audience here around um, systems and whether or not we're developing capabilities or products. And maybe Nitin, I'll ask you to start here. And Anthony, uh, maybe you can follow up with things we might be doing in consumer, right? So that was great. are we going to clients through ML and AI products or are we going to mainly have our operating model around services and providing it at an enterprise level? What I would like to kind of uh, focus on is one word, hybrid. And the reason I kind of mentioned hybrid is because uh, as is the case with much uh, of the technology disruption that is taking place, AI being one pillar of that disruption, it is not just about products. Neither is it just about services. It's about solving business problems, thinking through the solution that will help solve the business problem. And solutions by its very nature is a hybrid entity because you have to actually provide the necessary services that is conducive for the client's environment, but it should not necessarily be bespoke. It should not necessarily kind of just be based on uh, what the requirements of the client is. There's a, there's a lot of knowledge that could be brought to bear. There is intellectual capital that can be productized and specifically when we are talking of artificial intelligence, which at the heart, 
how to fit is the advanced algorithms, whether it is machine learning or deep learning algorithms, those algorithms essentially can be taken from one industry to the other. And those algorithms continuously learn from the data, comprehend the data, generate the necessary insights and render the actions based on what they study and what they learn from that data. All that can be productized. It is because of it that the field of artificial intelligence is more about a hybrid solution and not about just a product or just a service. Awesome, absolutely. And, and I'm sure Anthony, you have some examples in consumer that uh, demonstrate this hybrid solution plus service. Yeah, I mean, so it's interesting, Nishida. Um, I, I don't have the study in front of me and I know that uh, one of our colleagues, Brett Davis, who's our global leader for our Converge Industries platform, which really, quite frankly, is the catalyst for our hybrid businesses, and then did a phenomenal job in describing the importance of bringing assets and solutions table. So we have an executive meeting, I don't know, it was probably six or seven months ago, and Brett comes back with this study from Gartner. And pre-COVID, it was a study that Gartner did that says, what do most enterprises look for in their professional services partners? And at the time, number 18 was differentiated assets and solutions. So then COVID happens. We all go through our relative chaos and trying to work our way through our lives. And Gartner repeats the study. And now the use of assets and solutions as a professional services partner is number three. So the simple answer is a firm like Deloitte does not have an option on whether or not we develop differentiated assets. And the advantage that we have is to take our industry expertise, couple it with technical expertise, and really bring a differentiated set of solutions. And to be more specific, if I look at what we are currently doing across our primary sectors, we're investing very heavily in retail and consumer products as we speak right now, and combining many assets and solutions that we've developed over the last decade. But back to this insights value chain and the insights driven enterprise, we've got to connect the own parts of the puzzle as well. And so how do we help our clients achieve that integrated outcome by coupling together more of the assets and solutions, especially because that study said they're going to be expecting it from us? Yeah, absolutely. And as we talked about connecting back office and front office, we know there are multiple bespoke solutions across that value chain and bringing that together in a, in a cohesive platform that enables data to go from beginning to end in a seamless manner um, is going to be incredibly important. And so I know we're doing that in consumer. Another example of something we're doing, and I mentioned it in my intro, was around Smart Factory, which combines ecosystems where we're bringing together players like AWS and Siemens um, and SAP and Infor in addition right to technologies like 5G with Verizon and AI and startups like Drishti who does a lot of computer vision and helps with quality and helps to make sure that we can take the manual processes out and have the actual humans focus on the art of creating the entire product not an individual bespoke item and I think a lot of what we're doing there is around a platform, right, that connects that data from the beginning of the value chain from the supplier all the way to the output and allows an organization to do what they do best, which is manufacture the product and not worry about the back end systems that connect all of that. So just a few examples, hopefully that helped answer our constituents question. Um, so I'm going to go to the next question around future and trends. And Anthony, I'm going to go to you first, right? So you've talked a lot about customer experience. You've talked about new technologies that are impacting the way we're going to experience retail or other elements of consumer. Tell me a little bit about three to five years out. Where do you see this industry going and how technology has impacted it? Yeah, so Nishida, you and Nitin know that I'm an avid reader. I try to get through about a book a week. I would say the best thing I read wasn't a book recently, but it was by our chief futurist, Eamon Kelly. And he had partnered uh, with Jason Grisadis, and they developed a pretty outstanding point of view. And one of the major components was this idea of human-centric ecosystems powered by digital networks, digital ecosystems. And the reality of it is humans are no longer passive recipients. We're no longer passive recipients with goods and services in society, right? And I saw a question come through also around customer-centric organizations versus governments. It doesn't matter. We can wake up as consumers, employees, citizens. At the end of the day, humans are no longer passive recipients. They're the vital beating heart of society, of enterprises. And so this is a world where employees, 
and consumers and citizens are empowered. Learning is happening at exponential rates. And the more learning it is, then the more continuous shifts we're going to see around the overall expectations of the human experience. I do see three to five years out, and we're making the pivot within the consumer industry. The conversations have intensified greatly. My expectation would be that all enterprises will be focused on being both profitable and purposeful and having to demonstrate the ability to do that. I also see radical blurring of sector boundaries, creating kind of new outcomes and use cases. Look, we're not immune to it. We have our own constructs by which we organize our industries. But on a day-to-day -day basis, if I think about my industry colleagues, we spend the majority of our time talking about solving big issues that serve multiple industries. So lastly, I say with that blurring, I think what we're gonna see is more simultaneous kind of competitiveness, but collaborativeness, and then co-creating at the same time. I love it. I love that cross industry and multi industry view. I know, Anthony, you and I talk a lot about the convergence of things like financial services and health with government because all the regulatory elements of it that help protect us as patients. How does that come together with consumer? Because the consumer will interact with it in a lot of retail, retail kind of environments. So that convergence of industries and the ability to share data seamlessly across them and use AI to do that is going to be important. So Nitin, I'm going to ask you a follow-up question on it. And, and Anthony referred to the question we got in the chat around customer-centric organizations and government organizations. Um, you know, I know you work on both sides of the house. Can you give us a little flavor of if you're seeing differences or are similarities between them? Both actually, both in terms of similarities as well as differences. The similarities are in the context of capabilities that are required, both in the government space and in the private uh, commercial space. The differences are the application of those uh, capabilities in terms of where, how, and in what context uh, it is actually applied. Um, if you take kind of uh, the work that even we as an organization do with many of our clients in the commercial private uh, sector of the economy versus the government uh, sector of the economy, Every client is now dealing with how to modernize their data infrastructure. Why? Because uh, the data that used to be generated used to be from backend systems. It could be an ERP system, it could be a finance system, it could be an HR system, it could be a supply chain system. Now, because of the proliferation of smart devices, gadgets, appliances, et cetera, they are able to get continuous streaming data from sensors and all these smart devices and IoT devices that are proliferating in the environment and economy at large. They need to rewire their data infrastructure. They need to think about different forms and shapes and uh, rethink the volume, veracity, and the velocity of that data. So they're grappling with that. It's both in the commercial side and it's in the government side. They are thinking about what type of uh, algorithms have to be developed for those type of data sets and how do you actually develop those algorithms as well as apply those uh, algorithms. That's another capability that uh, is ubiquitous across uh, the different parts of the uh, economy. Both uh, sides of the uh, equation are also looking at uh, how to uh, increase the productivity of the employees through the application of uh, conversational AI, whether it happens to be in a contact center or otherwise, you take large telco companies, you take uh, consumer companies, any or financial uh, services companies. Anytime we as consumers and, and individuals call in, more often than not, we're now interacting with a virtual digital agent. Mm. What is a virtual digital agent? A virtual digital agent is essentially the application of conversational AI, which in it uh, in its very basic form is natural language processing and natural language generation algorithms. But guess what? That's the same for government uh, centers. When uh, we as uh, citizens called in to essentially a contact center that was established during the past one year for the uh, pandemic in various states, we were interacting partly with a virtual digital agent. When we, depending on kind of, uh, you know, whether we have uh, Medicare or not, call in to the 1-800-Medicare number and interact with government services associated with the Medicare and, and healthcare, at times we're interacting with a virtual digital agent. 
So the capabilities are the same. The applications are different. And yes, in government, some of those applications also extend to national defense. It extends to uh, intelligence work that is necessary. And it, it, and it uh, also uh, extends to defense innovation that is uh, taking place. So the way I would kind of uh, articulate it is same capabilities, different applications. The other thing that is the same, which we should uh, also take into account, trustworthiness. That doesn't change. Whether it is government services and the trust that government has to foster in uh, the hearts and minds of citizens, or whether it is a commercial enterprise that has to foster the same level of trust in the hearts and minds of consumers, it is one and the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to get to that trustworthy point in a second. But on your point around the, the government and, and industry and capabilities being the same, applications maybe being different, you know, having spent time on both sides of the house, one thing on the government side is the scale. Right. At which they have to deal with the application of these technologies, as well as not just for the government operations, but also in terms of how do they provide guidance and frameworks and, and regulatory advice to organizations to make sure we all have an element of trustworthiness and ethics around the AI that we're using. So very complicated, um, but very interesting. And I will say, um, even though none of us have really traveled internationally in a long time, global entry is one of my favorite things where computer vision recognizes me the minute I go up there, I don't have to put a single piece of data in and I can get right back in. I love it. So the government is absolutely embracing those technologies. So Anthony, I'm gonna go to you around trustworthiness again. Um, there's a question in here about, you know, how do we use design thinking approaches to help us build our capabilities and products at the same time assuring our customers that we're using a trustworthy data infrastructure? Yeah, I mean, I guess a couple of thoughts on this one. Um, I've had just a minute or two to reflect on. So, you know, prior to leading the consumer industry, I had the privilege of leading the Deloitte digital business for a few years. And I think one of the things that, um, that, I, that I'm most proud of is the shift that the business made around this idea to elevate the human experience. And there's a differentiated set of capabilities that we have within the business, really focused on human-centered design. And Nitin and all three of us have talked over the last you know, 35 minutes or so about this idea of age of width. We have disproportionately invested in continuing to scale our human-centered design business, coupling it with our technology capabilities. And the ongoing integration of those two things is what drives up value. But we had this aspiration to elevate the human experience and COVID hits, and we're really proud of what we're doing to combine these two things, human-centered design and tech, but we realized that there was this underlying collapse in trust. So we go to the firm and we say, hey, we, we have this really interesting idea to launch a body of research. And our chief experience officer, Amelia Dunlop, and our customer brand and experience officer within the auto, travel, and hospitality space, Ashley Reichhild, they get together, they get a group of people together, and they launch this body of research called the HX for Human Experience Trust ID. And we know going in that trust drives both customer and employee loyalty, which both obviously have a huge impact on business results. But the data was pretty staggering. Nearly 90% of customers who highly trusted a brand bought from them again, right? Nearly 80% of employees who highly trust their employer feel motivated to do better work, right? So there was a material shift. So then we had to dig it down a few layers and really get to a point where, well, if trust is an important part of brands succeeding in this customer-led material shift in the market, then how do we help enterprises better understand their trust scores? And we developed a measure that could look at humanity, transparency, capability and reliability. And through that, we can develop trust scores for different enterprises. So some of the most exciting conversations and difficult, to be honest, that we've had with many uh, executives in the last year or so is to talk to them about where they sit relative to their peers around trust. But trust will be a material part of how brands continue to drive loyalty going forward. Yeah, that trust conversation is so pervasive, whether it's trusting in the brand, you know, trusting in an organization's ability to deliver, trusting in their ability to keep data private um, and keep that secure or use it in the right way. And I think, Anthony, you hit on a lot of those. So thank you. OK, so we have a, um, about 10 minutes left and I'm going to move to a really important topic around talent. Um, we're talking about some really exciting technologies, it, it, you know, applications of them, the management of them. But it all takes 
talent to be able to actually drive in the future. Um, and as we all know, and I'm sure many of you out there know, right, talent is at a premium. Um, there is more work than there is talent, and we need to be able to not just acquire talent, but we have to upskill and reskill our own talent for the new modern economy and the way technology is going to be used going forward. So, Nitin, I'll start with you. You know, can you comment a little bit on how we as organizations should be thinking about creating and cultivating talent? Yeah, this this is uh, a seminal topic as it relates to the degree to which an organization can actually progress with, embrace, and truly become AI field. If there is kind of one big barrier that most organizations are facing, it is access to talent. So let me sort of uh, unpack this a bit because uh, I purposefully mentioned access to talent. The thinking that many of us have, including you know Deloitte for uh, the longest time has had, is how do we go and hire the best talent that is out there? The word that we anchor on is hire. What we are now kind of finding in the world of AI is that it is not so much about hiring the talent within your four walls. It is about accessing the talent from the broader ecosystem. The ecosystem shouldn't necessarily just be about the alliances and the partnerships and the vendors that one actually works with. It is about what is all the sources of talent that is out there. Can we essentially access talent from academia? Can we have a partnership with startups? And while the individuals and the talent who works in those startups may not want to come and join a large organization, can they actually work with the uh, large organization? Can we tap into the uh, gig economy and go to a number of what are called talent clouds that are out there and get hard to uh, find skill sets. Example, if we are digitizing a contact center and applying conversational AI and building these virtual digital agents, it's not just about the algorithm. You also need skill sets of a linguist. You need a linguist to actually voice train that virtual digital agent. We've got Anthony, we've got Nishita, we've got Nitin on this call. The accents that the three of us have is different because of our backgrounds, because of our ethnicity. A virtual digital agent needs to be trained to pick up those accents. As an example, those are skill sets that one may not actually think of hiring within an organization. So the key over here is shifting the mindset from hiring the best talent to accessing the best talent from the broader ecosystem through a variety of sources and making sure that one creates the right environment for all that, all those talented individuals to work together as part of a team, irrespective of which organization they are part of. Love it. It's all about tapping in to various sources of talent. Like we said, it doesn't all have to reside internally. Anthony, any comments from you, given the organization you run and you know, you're working with our people every day um, on projects, on um, sales opportunities, et cetera. What are you seeing around talent? Yeah, I mean, look, I think it's safe to say that it's a highly competitive environment right now um, in terms of sourcing talent. I actually love Nitin's idea around partnerships in terms of achieving outcomes. You know, look, one of the recent books that I read also is Reimagining Capitalism. And the thing that really affected me in there is when we think about enterprises independently, many enterprises over time have tried to do things in a more sustainable way, a more responsible way, a more equitable way. But when doing it alone and you have other competitors who are not making material shifts, it's very, very difficult to stay the course. My expectation is as the market continues to shift and large portions of the market continue to focus on being more sustainable, being more responsible. I think you're going to see consortiums develop kind of the shared sense of purpose, shared sense of capability across sectors and across segments where you're tapping into pools of technology, you know, te technical talent in order to achieve outcomes at a great, it will be, again, it gets back to that whole idea of the ecosystem. It gets back to the blurring of lines there will absolutely be competitive environments, but you will also see simultaneously collaborative environments and co-creative environments. And I think that's what that's going to do is accelerate the access to tech and to skills. So not everybody's building capability internally, 
but there will be moments we compete and there'll be moments that we share to get to a greater result. That's awesome. And, you know, I, I heard a statistic recently and, and you pointed to this, right? It's the collaboration. It's the diversity of talent. It's the pulling in of a variety of skill sets. Um, you know, when organizations actually combine data and AI skills with creative skills, they actually have a 2x impact on growth versus other organizations. And you can only imagine how that continues to exponentially grow as you include a variety of disciplines and really create that diverse workforce that enables us to think about problems in a more creative way. So that's great. Okay, we have five minutes left. So I'm gonna pose one more question I think is a great one that just came in too, to both of you and we'll wrap it up. So, you know, we talked a lot about how enterprises view AI, right? And obviously in our jobs, we're serving other businesses who are, who are using that to fuel their own businesses. But how should the general public view it, right? It can empower businesses, but is it something that the average person should fear or embrace? Nitin, I'll start with you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes uh, this tends to be kind of uh, the elephant in the room. And I like to kind of believe that uh, it's partly an elephant in the room and uh, there's a fear factor that exists out there because uh, we've got a habit of watching too many Hollywood movies, <laughs> which <laughs> kind of further sort of perpetuates uh, some of the fear factor associated with AI. Here's what I would kind of say in terms of how the general public uh, should be with. We talked a lot about AI being the force that generates insights. Um, Anthony mentioned something that is crucial. In our everyday lives and in the general kind of uh, society out there, AI is the biggest accelerant to enhanced experiences. The way that we interact, what we expect, the service that is now provided to us, the personalization that is brought to bear, and all basically kind of uh, the systems and the, and the devices that we now have access to and interact with in our daily lives, that is fueled by AI. So as individuals, the greatest value of AI is in transformed or enhanced experiences, which has led to a different set of expectations in terms of uh, what we expect in as it relates to organizations that we interact, what it, uh, uh, what it basically kind of means even in the context of human to human interactions, much fueled by social media now, or uh, kind of at least using that as the medium, or even in the very near future, the expectation that uh, when we kind of place an order, it is quote unquote going to be instantaneously delivered to us through autonomous drones, as an example, or in the next set of vehicles that we could be buying over the course of uh, the next five years, we would have intelligent surfaces built into the vehicle that allows us to conduct a whole variety of transactions based on touch uh, as, uh, as uh, the vehicle is uh, being quote unquote self-driven. So it is through the set of transformed and enhanced experiences that we as individuals in the general public are probably going to see the biggest impact and the most beneficial impact of AI. Awesome. So there are a lot of benefits I heard. How, how about you, Anthony? What do you feel like over here? Fear or embrace? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Um, you know, uh, you know, my father growing up said used to tell me that the two most toxic things in life are fear and expectation. Um, and uh, but he'd also tell me all the time that it's not for anybody but the individual to determine what they fear, what their expectations are. So I would never, let's say, put an opinion on whether or not somebody should be fearful. But the reality of it is, is that if you've got a device in your hand and you're using that on a daily basis, you're engaging with AI on a daily basis. And there's upside and downside. Um, I think about surviving the pandemic, not being able to live, you know, leave the home and the value of what I could accomplish and the value of things that came to me without me thinking about it, back to that more personalized, more localized, more precise you know, opportunity, whether it be the social media channels, whatever it is, that specific opportunity, the use of AI to engage with me as a consumer of many things and a consumer of experiences in general, quite frankly, it acted as fuel for me to kind of work my way through the pandemic with my family. At the same time, you know, I've got five kids. I, I got to keep up, right? I mean, you know, they're faster and better at tech than I am. Um, but our 16-year-old daughter came home and she made the entire family watch the documentary, The Social Dilemma, largely because she felt it was important to be educated on all sides of the equation, 
So I look at it and say, when we fear something, very often it's because we misunderstand it. So I would just encourage everybody to the degree that you can continue to lean into back to that whole idea of knowledge is burdened with the past and learning, learning is really about the future. Continue to lean in and understand and educate yourself as best you can. And my gut tells me fear will slowly drop. Depending on how fast you read, it could quickly drop. <laughs> but yes, it will slowly drop over time. I love it. I, you know, I have a very sim similar sentiments, Anthony. I think it's one of these things where, you know, we think about the industrial revolution of a hundred years ago and you think about the friction and the change it caused. We're in a similar revolution and there will be a lot of change and there will be a lot of friction. But the important thing to note, just as we came out of the industrial revolution, we came out far healthier and stronger as a, as a human race and as an economy globally. And I think the same thing will be true here. But to your point, continuous learning is the key. Right. No longer is it enough to have learned for four years and have a job for 30. You know, it is one of those continual learning, continual changing and continual challenging of ourselves. So great. Thank you, Anthony and Nitin. What a wonderful discussion today. I truly enjoyed it. I hope the audience did, too. And I'm going to turn it back to Bina to talk about what's up next. Thank you. That was a, an amazing discussion. And thank you to our audience for tuning in. Join Nitin Deloitte's AI leader every month as he discusses AI across different industries. Our next session will focus on financial services. It's on July 27th at 1 Eastern, where Nitin will be joined by Liliana Robu, our financial services industry leader. My name is Bina Amanat, and I'm the executive director for our global Deloitte AI Institute. You can stay connected with me, Anthony, Nishita, and Nitin on the Deloitte AI Institute. We'd love to keep the conversation go going, so visit us. Thank you all, and take care.